Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Jerry Bond, and I just want to welcome you to the service today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you that this is an awesome day that you gave us. This is an awesome day that you're showing us. This is an awesome day that you're revealing your heart, your thoughts, your way to all your children. All have been called by you. All, none shall be lost. All shall be come to the salvation that you gave us. All shall come to know your Lord, the Son, and the most highest of God. We just give you praise. We just give you word. You're just worthy to be worshipped. We just love you, Father. Let everything that's said, everything that's done, work perfectly in your thoughts, in your eyes. Let us tell the perfect story about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just give you praise, Lord, in everything, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. We're going to talk to you today in, in 1 Corinthians 15, the verse first, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I have preached to you, which you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you are saved, to keep it in your memory what I have preached to you, unless you have been believed in vain. You know, the gospel is being preached all across the world, and they said when the gospel is being preached, then all would come to salvation. So when you begin to understand what the gospel is, it means good news. It means what good news? It means that God sent his son, the best he had, for every person on the face of the earth, every person that's ever been born, every person, man, woman, or child, he wants all to be saved and none to be lost. He wants this to work perfectly in me and you and every person. So we began to realize what Jesus did. Now, some, one of the most interesting things in modern day is in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, that they preach another Jesus. Now, there's a lot of confusion in the Word. You need to go to the Bible and read what the Bible says. Now, be careful in the translations, the various translations. If you really want to look, go to the concordance and see what the original meaning in the Greek and the, and the, and the Hebrew is. I like to read King James, but I also like to look and see what each word would mean. Some places they change the deity or change the word completely. So Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, that they're preaching another Jesus. Now, the reason this is going on is not particularly against anyone or anything, but people tend to try to justify in their mind what their lifestyles or the way they're living, they're trying to justify that into the way they're, the expression of their whole person. Now, the Word of God is very clear on everything. It says, Jesus gave us an example. In Luke 4, he says, I have come to tell you, and Satan was testing him. He said, I've come to tell you the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to everyone, the poor, the sick, the blind, the lame, the crippled, the lepers, and the good news is now. This was quoted from Isaiah uh, chapter 61, verse 1 through 5, about eight, seven or 800 years before Jesus was born. So you can study this out. Now, the Word of God, the gospel has not changed from the first day Jesus preached it. John the Baptist preached repentance and, he, and salvation through water baptism. Now, the water baptism does not save you, even though some people believe that it does. It says by, in Ephesians 2, it says, For by grace, through faith, not of works, lest you boast. You are saved because of God's grace through faith in him. That's how you get saved. Otherwise, you'd boast about, well, look what I've done or look what... No, it's what the Spirit of God says. We're saved by grace. 
We can't work our way to, way to get better. If we did, every one of us would be trying to work our way. And I know it says one place in Philippians, work out your salvation. All that means is you're trying to walk with God every day and believe God and speak his word and live for God and do those things. But the point is, we're talking about the gospel. We're talking about what it really means. Now, there, there are some that have this good time gospel, that if you do all these things, God is going to bless you richly with money and power and all these positions, and he does. But if, if you allow all the treasures that God gives us, and he gives all of us treasure, some of us reject them, some of us receive them. But when you, you start operating in that, if, you, if you're not careful, you will be puffed up Look who I am. Look what I've done. And it's all about God. It's in Deuteronomy 8, 18. He said, I give you the power to create wealth. It's not about who you are. You, you may have had the thought. God gave you the thought. God gave you the power. God gave you the place to do this. He put all those places together. If you think about this for, just for a moment and you get beyond yourself, the gospel was sent to bring all men, all women, all boys, and girls, all people into black, brown, red, whatever color, whatever nationality, to bring them all into salvation. Salvation means to come into the covenant relationship with the Holy God. Now, how did he do this? He did this in Hebrews uh, the cha chapter 8, 9, and 10, verse, especially chapter 10. He says, verse 10 through 14, he says, once and for all, my son's blood was shed just for you and brought every person in and washed out every sin on the earth. Now, that sin is not washed away until you and I speak directly to that, that sin and say, in the name of Jesus, I repent of that sin. Then that blood effaciously cleans you and me, makes us whole from the inside out. So we began to speak, we began to say, we began to know that Jesus is come to bring us life, John 10, 10, and the thief comes but to kill, to steal, and destroy now, some people want to throw $10 in an offering plate or $1,000 or do all kinds of things to try to buy grace and mercy. You cannot do this. God doesn't need your money. He owns all the cattle, all the hills, all the oil, all the gold. He owns everything. But men try to make these things and try to build apparatuses and try to build little tidbits how you can do this and you can get these things. Let me tell you something. God knows your heart and my heart. What changes us is the Holy Spirit coming into us and filling us with the presence of God. How do you do that? Well, you humble yourself and ask for forgiveness. When you do, in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, the Heavenly Father says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit that asks? And so we ask Him, we receive it by grace by mercy, by goodness, by God's goodness. He loves us unconditionally. He loves us in spite of who we are. He loves us in everything that we are, everything that we do. And we need to do things and say things like he says about it. Now, what happens to you and me is we try to get into the flesh and try to make a deal or work a deal. Now, one of my Texas cowboy terms about this is called jerking around. You're jerking around in the flesh. You're trying to coerce the ruler of the world, the creator of all the universe, you're trying to coerce him into doing something for you or justifying what you're doing or you're trying to get him to bless what you're doing so you're working all kinds of little deals to try to make it. It doesn't work that way. Or you will maybe you're belligerent and you're mad and you're rebellious so you try to act and you try to do all these things to try to coerce God into saying, it's okay, son, just go ahead. That's not the way it works. Grace is God's goodness. Grace is God's mercy. Grace is God's outpouring of himself into me and you by the Spirit. Now remember, God is Spirit. And so when you come into this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, just like it was upon Jesus, to do what? To go into all the earth and be witnesses. So you began to look, you began to see, you began to act, you began to, you began to purpose in your life what you're about. Now, the place you go to church on Sunday morning or during the week or even out at the ranch or wherever you are is a place where you are and you're talking to your heavenly father. He is ever present with you. He's not someplace off. Now, I was always, I was kind of naive in this. I always thought you had to go and be and do all these things or go down to the church. And, and that's a place, okay? It's a, a serene place and a quiet place, but you can do it on top of a mountain or out by a stream or wherever or in your backyard or wherever you uh, are at at the moment, you can get quiet before the Lord and listen. How does God talk to you and me? According to the gospel, 
And, and from Acts through the end of the book, God talks to us through his word. God talks to us by angels. God talks to us by an audible voice sometimes. God talks to us sometimes by a still small voice. God talks to us in various kinds of ways. So he talks to you, but sometimes if you're always blabbering or talking, he doesn't, you can't hear him. So you got to listen to what he's saying. So when you come back to reality, when you're, when you're up against it, what do you do? I would like to talk for just a moment about healing. A lot of people in, in the body of Christ and around the world are sick in their body. They're sick in their mind. They're sick in all these things. How do they get the healing to manifest by Jesus' stripes? We are healed. One of the ways that I, I believe you might do this is you might listen to your confession. Now, generally what we do when someone comes into our hospital room or into our house or we fall or we hurt ourselves or something happens to us, we tend to immediately start saying, oh, my back, oh, my leg, oh, my head, oh, my arm, or this is what the doctor says, or this is what the report says. And we go and we tend to rehearse that. We get, and so who are we glorifying? We're glorifying Satan. You got to believe on this earth, there's two forces at work. One is Satan and all his devils and demons, a third of the angels. And on the other side, he's got Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God with two thirds of the angels doing op opposite of what Satan's doing. Look around you in Romans 5, it says, when sin abounds, grace abounds more. So people are sinning and they're unrepentant. Paul said in some of his writings in 1 Corinthians 11, when you take the communion, the bread and the wine, the bread represents Jesus' broken body. By his stripes, we are healed. That's in Isaiah 53, verse 3, 4, and 5, and 1 Peter 2, 24. There's various, many, many hundreds of healing scriptures. And you'll hear people say, well, I pray, Lord, if it be thy will. We'll go to Matthew 6 and look at it says, thy will be done. Now to say, if it be thy will, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God wants his will for his children to be healed and whole. Otherwise, God is a looney tune. He's a heretic. If he sent his son down here to earth to heal me and you and put it in his word, by his stripes you're healed. And then you say, God doesn't want you healed. Or Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Or Paul left a, a friend of his sick somewhere. The whole point is that God put Jesus on the cross for every person to be complete. Salvation, healing, deliverance, all these things. Acts 10, 38, God sent Jesus to all that are oppressed of the devil. So you realize that people are oppressed. Look around you in the falseness of religion. They kill one another, and, and it's, it comes against what Jesus is saying. They go do all these things, or they go and they mass, massacre somebody in a church meeting, or they go and shoot somebody in a movie theater, or they do all these things. Why are they doing that? Because they're selfish and they're blinded, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Now, healing was set forth to heal our minds, heal our bodies, and to bring us to the fullness of the Lord. When we center up, on Jesus. He is the gospel. He is the good news. If you're centered on anything else, your pastor may be the finest man or finest woman on the face of the earth. They may be doing everything they know to do for the kingdom. You may love them and you may help them and you do all those things, but they're just a person. In my life, I've had two great people in my life, and I was disappointed by both of them. But it wasn't because they were replacing God. It was just that I had my eyes upon them rather than upon the Lord. Once I quit looking at man or a woman or another person and began to look at the real person, the Lord Jesus, who is God himself, spirit, soul, and body in us, I began to see the things that helps me to overcome. Or to call cowboy up if you want to look at it in a, in a country boy way. You know, you see people when you talk about cowboy, you talk about ranching, you talk about farming, you talk about uh, gardening, you talk about the things of the earth. And we have people, you know, that are hugging Mother Earth and they're loving trees and all these things. Their, their minds are not on the Lord who created all those things. In Romans chapter 8, it says creation is crying out, waiting for man to come to a place where he gives God the glory. Who created man? Who created all the animals? Who created all these things? It's just like I don't have a problem with people loving animals. I like animals too. I love my horses and my dogs and, and everything, but I'm, I'm not going to put them in the same category as God and Jesus. I mean, you just don't do that. Or you can love your wife or your husband. You can love them, you know, with the very every part of your body, but you can't put them in the place of Jesus because he is the center of who we are. Now, you can love your wife in, with the, to the Lord and come to walk with that, but you're not going to go and see beyond the glory of the gospel. 
the gospel is Jesus says, I've come for the good news. I love you. I love you in spite of you. I love you in spite of your sin. I love you in spite of all that stuff you've been doing. I love you now. But in your mind, you're trying to justify what you're saying, what you're doing. You know, there's a great fight right now in the, in the U.S. Supreme Court. There's a great fight in the political arena. Who's going to be the next president? And how are we ever going to get around all the things that we've done and said to each other? Well, let me tell you something. God allowed and God put the people we have in power either to make us so glad or so sad. Either are. And it depends on which end of the spectrum you're on. My thought is this. Have you prayed for those people that are leading us? Have you bound the enemy that is leading those people? Or have you speaking curses upon them? What is your attitudes towards them? What is your understanding about people that are going out and, and killing folks? What is your attitude? Would you, would you pray for that person even though he just killed you? Or would you forgive him? But the whole point is think of the loss. Now, if you center up on the lost, you always remember all things work together for good for those that are called. Every person is called, so God's going to take those tragedies and make something good. Or how about something comes along and you say, well, I just don't have the understanding. When you have the understanding and the thoughts of God, when you're spending time in the Word and spending time in prayer, He will bring you to His knowledge, His wisdom, and His understanding about what His business is. We ought to be about His business. When you're about His business, you're blessed, you're going, and everything's going your way. Well, you say, well, I'm trying to serve God and everything's going to hell. Quit confessing what Satan is doing and start confessing what Jesus is doing. Don't look at the scoreboard, how many nickels you got in your pocket or how much money you got at the bank or how your stock's done. All those things are temporal. Look at the things that are eternal. The good news is eternal. Jesus said in John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son for the, uh, all those who call on his name. Who calls on should have eternal life. That is us that calls on him and we have eternal life. My favorite verse is John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask anything. So when we abide in him, that, that God eternal life operates in us. That is the good news. Well, what is the good news? Where are you in the good news? How do I get the good news into me? How do I walk in the power of it? Well, you just, you just start confessing it and ask God for forgiveness and mercy. You know, I get tickled at folks that they always call you and they've always eyeball deep in the alligator pit and they're just nipping right at the seat of the britches and the creditors are after them and the bankruptcy's after them and they can't make their payments and Uncle Joe's sick and Aunt Sally's sick and the dogs have run off and all the things are happening the kids are beating up on one another and everything's just not good and so they say, what can I do? Well, when are you going to quit confessing what you got and start saying what you need? Call the things that be not, as the Bible says in Romans 4, 17. Call in that thing that you need. When you begin to walk in faith, you will do that. I call it devil-busting, rock-throwing rock time. In, in Mark 11, 23, it says, Whoever says, Say this mountain, be thou removed, and cast that mountain into the sea. What is that? Whatever that problem is, cast it away from you, and believe in your heart what you're saying and how what you're saying. It doesn't say pray. The next verse talks about prayer. Most, time, most times people spend all time praying, and they remind God of all the dumb stuff they've done. Why don't they start saying, okay, Father, I just come to talk to you and worship you. Why not just forget all that nonsense that you're in and start praising him? You know, God loves the praise of his people. He wants it. He is jealous. He desires it. What is your problem? Why don't you turn from it? Why don't you seek his presence? Why don't you come on and enter the kingdom? Why are you allowing yourself to be so beat up? You know, cast those thoughts down. Cast those cares upon him. You know, you may not have a mate because you haven't asked God for a mate. You may have a bad husband or a bad wife or an unfaithful wife, and you say, what do I do? You bind that spirit of lust that's on them. Lust the us, lust the flesh, pride of life is what gets most people in hot water. Where's the hot water? Whatever's tearing you down. Whatever's do well, I go to church all the time, and we pray and we pray and pray, and nothing happens. Have you ever thought about shut up and pray a new prayer? Have you ever thought about asking God? Have you ever thought about digging around in the Word and find out what God would say about what your problem is, go to the concordance. I mean, some of them have some real good encyclopedia uh, concordances that will explain most generally even a word. You know, there's an old place in the Bible called Lodibar. Lodibar is down at the ends of nowhere. But if you study it, it's mentioned one time in the Bible, and God used that through David. So amazingly, we see things that can happen even in the worst places, in the most remote places. God is in the business of taking me and you and seating us in heavenly places. 
If you're void of the Spirit, it talks about in Jude, and there's a lot of people in our society today are void of the Holy Spirit. They are selfish, they're inwardly, and they're doing these things, they're motivated. Nearly every one of them, all of us have these little handheld gadgets in our hand, and I call those things mind control if you're not careful. Even the little children have them, and they're good at it, and they know how to make it work. But if that thing is taking you from the presence of God, you need to put it up on the cabinet and leave it alone for a little while. You need to get your Bible out and see what God has has to say you know I, I do these sermons without without notes but that, how do I get this I spend time in the word and in prayer with the Lord Jesus I spend time praising him all the time I thank him constantly for what he's doing and I try to keep the right attitude loving all people in spite of their tribulations that to enter the kingdom now now is the day of salvation now is the day for you to step up now is the day when we gather the whole pasture we don't miss one or two under the brush or one that got away out in the wilderness or one that we didn't witness to you know I get tickled at people says well I just knew I ought to pray for that person but I didn't do it well why didn't you do it it's because you and I are short-sighted in the things of God. If you spend time with the master and with the carpenter, you will find out how he builds the house. You will find out how he moves the sanctuary. You will find out what his plans, his purposes are. You will find out what the Lord says, the good news. Well, what is the good news? You know, you'll hear people say, well, we're doing all these things for, in the name of the Lord. A lot of people that hang around church buildings, secretaries and others, they mean well and they're, hungry. they're just like me. They want to do everything they can for the kingdom. But sometimes we're so busy, being busy, that we miss the Lord Jesus. We're so busy about doing vacation Bible school, or we're so busy uh, going around and doing all the little things that we do, and we miss that precious time with the Spirit and with the with the Son and with the Father, where we're communicating, we're fellowshipping, we're we're enjoying His presence. You remember the story about Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, Lazarus' sisters. You know, and one of them was kind of bad mouth, and the other says, "Lord, I've been working all this time. I've been doing everything. You know here." And Lazarus and y'all are just sitting here having a good time. And he says, you're missing the best part. Come and sit down and rest at my feet. Sometimes when you're so busy, you need to just stop and get it in the presence and set it to the Lord's feet and let him teach you. Let him open your understanding. You know, in Ephesians 1 verse 17, now the God of this world has opened to Jesus the wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of who? Of Jesus. So if you don't ask God to open your wisdom and give you revelation into him, how are you ever going to walk in the power of it? How are you ever going to understand it? How are you ever going to know him? God wants us to be so intimate that it's like when a man and woman, when they're on their wedding day, they become one flesh, so intimate, so close, so united, so in the bond of love, in the bond of the spirit of love. They just love each other unconditionally. They're brought there and it's so wonderful. That's the way God wants us to be with his son. He wants us to walk in the power and the presence that he has for us. He wants us to be passionate and compassionate one for another. He wants us to move in the, in the gifts of the spirit. He wants us to operate in that. He wants us to operate in the power of the spirit, casting down devils and, and removing them and moving obstacles and, and have wisdom and knowledge of what to do. But we become religious. We get we take on a religious attitude and we think and it blinds us. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. He says, you won't enter the kingdom and neither will you let anybody up. And most people think the kingdom is down at the church, but I'm telling you the kingdom is right in here. You'll see people in Israel and Jerusalem going down to the wedding wall. And there's nothing wrong. That's a very special place. And it is a special place. But the point is, they need to go down there and they need to get right with God. They need to repent and get away from their religious and turn to God and ask him to heal their nation. It's like we need this nation healed. But instead, what do we do? We're so selfish. I want me, mine, and my four and whoever. I want us blessed and to heck with everybody else. No, you need to get serious and start praying that the, this nation and other nations would repent, turn from their wicked ways, and God says, I will heal their land. The Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but we have leadership that does not want to do that. We have leadership, but what do we do? We bind the enemy that's blinded our leadership. We're not mad at our leadership. We're mad at the spirit that's messing with our leadership. Who's messing with your mind today? Who put the thought on this shoulder or that shoulder? Who put the thought in your mind to cause you to say and do and act like you're acting? Where is love in that? Do you love yourself? Generally, we don't love ourselves enough to love anybody else. 
we're selfish so we don't love with the with the fruit of the spirit we don't walk in that we don't love one another unconditionally how are you going to do if you ever don't know and you don't ask what god's wanting you to do if you're out trying to gather a pasture of cattle and you go cut, take a shortcut and you go go to the corner you're told to go to or the darkest draw that you don't go to, have you ever thought you might have missed something over there? Have you ever thought, well, maybe I should have? And then you get where you are and you say, I should have done that. Well, God by the Spirit told you me to go into those corners, to go into those places, to go into those nooks and tell them, do you know the password? Well, what is the password? That whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ the Bible says he is the way, the truth, and the life shall come to the Father. When we call out to God, when we cry out to God, when we repent, when we turn from, we can go and drag those people out of the fire and take them to heaven because heaven is eternal. Hell is eternal. Which one are you going to? Life or death? Kingdom of heaven? Kingdom of hell? Which one do you want? God will let you make your own decision. But I got news for you. You can make that old horse drink that water. You say, how can you take a sinner and lead him up there? Because the Spirit of God is leading him. It says, if you lift up Jesus, and if you're honest with yourself, and your, your salvation is secure, when you're honest and you go to someone else, they will know they know that they know by looking at you, by the smile in your eyes and on your face, that you're a Jesus kid. When you begin to speak, and began to act and began to tell the good news. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the healer. He is the deliverer. He is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. He is the kinsman redeemer. He is the glory of God forevermore. He is the comforter. He is the blessing. He is the salvation. He is everything. What does he mean to you? What are you saying? Well, you're probably confessing just like I was for years and years. Oh, poor old me. No, once I got the revelation of who God is in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory, I mean, it changed my whole life. It brought me out of that. So as I close this, me, this sermon here today, I hope that I've convinced you to just say, okay, Lord Jesus, there's something special about you. Would you mind coming into my heart? Would you mind changing my heart? Would you mind filling me with your precious Holy Spirit? And would you mind showing me the ropes, how to walk, how to talk, and to be just like you? I just thank you, Lord, for doing that for each and every person today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.